I'm speaking with Dr. Eddie Lohmeyer, author of Unstable Aesthetics, Game Engines, and the Strangeness of Modding, published by Bloomsbury Academic, January 28th, 2021. Thank you for speaking with me. Of course. Thank you, Chris. And thank you. Thank you for having me on. Sure, sure. So first, how did you get into um, studying this subject and writing a book on it? That's a great question. Um, you know, in my graduate my graduate research and graduate studies, I, I consider myself uh, a trained art historian. So when I was first starting off in grad school, I was studying art history. Um, and I've, I've always kind of had an interest in what experimental filmmakers were doing, uh, especially in the, you know, the, the mid to late 60s and into the 70s. And particularly, uh, you know, filmmakers like Stan Brakhage and Tony Conrad, um, Nam June Pike, among others who were you know, interested in kind of excavating and, and playing with the materiality of cinema. So um, you know, they were doing experiments. Uh, Tony Conrad, his film, The Flicker in 1966 uh, was essentially a film in which he was just playing black and white frames um, uh, at different intervals and speeds to create kind of these uh, very psychedelic, um, illusory effects, right? And, and these effects would range from, you know, creating small hallucinations to kind of allowing people to kind of just bliss out in a way, right? Um, so those, those histories of experimental cinema and what artists were experimenting with in terms of technologies throughout the mid-century in the neo-avant-garde uh, have always kind of influenced how I approach video games and the study of video games. I, you know, I've always been, um, an, an amateur gamer. I, I played, you know, I've played PC games most of my life. I do play video games here and there for pleasure, uh, but it wouldn't be until I started my PhD at uh, North Carolina State in digital media where I really began to study and look at um, video games as a kind of artifact, right, uh, that artists could manipulate and, and play with. And so much of this research stems from, from kind of looking at these broader histories of, of digital media and certain technical developments and certain, certain aesthetic developments in histories of digital media. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, Unstable Aesthetics was, you know, it was a project I started with my dissertation and the whole idea was to trace a, a recent history of video game engines and an engine being something um, you know, an engine is a, is a broad term for a software framework that allows a video game to run, right, and render those graphics and to show uh, or to be able to perform physics and to allow a, a player to move throughout those virtually constructed worlds. So it's really interesting because beginning in the 1990s, th this is when you begin to, to see this word engine pop up mm -hmm. and you, you have, uh, you know, John Carmack, um, and John Romero at id Software, who, you know, create Doom in 1993, and they allow for Doom to be this extensible engine, right, that, that um, players and, and kind of grassroot, grassroots players and modders can begin to experiment and, and create what were called WAD files for that engine, and they could create their own game worlds, right, and so a lot of times they would create, um, for instance, like a version of James Cameron's Aliens, but they would use the Doom engine, or they would create like a Doom version of Ghostbusters, right? So I started getting really interested in this idea that artists could use these tool sets, right? That they could use these existing game engines to experiment and create these, these kinds of psychedelic disorienting works. So Unstable Aesthetics really it, it traces throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s um, what media artists were doing with game engines. And a lot of these media artists weren't weren't necessarily game designers or game designers at all. They just had background in coding and they had a very, I think, strong understanding of histories of experimental cinema, right? And experimental film. Um, so they started doing experiments where they would just disrupt the game world to an extent where something would be unplayable, right? Or when, you know, I'm thinking of um, the artist duo Jody, um, who, and it's a, they're an artist group consisting of Dirk Paisman's and Joan Heemskirk, um, their work on titled game, which they were experimenting with in the mid two or the mid, I should say late 1990s mm -hmm. into the mid 2000s. Um, 
they started taking like Quake, the Quake engine, and they disrupted it in a way that it would create like these, these kind of oscillating, swirling abstract patterns that would kind of cloud the viewer's ability to move throughout that game, right? And so it wasn't so much about a game being fun or pleasurable, it's, it's about a video game expressing different modes of play and different modes of sensation, right? That are kind of outside of that conventional normal um, expression of play. So to, to answer that question, yeah, a lot of, a lot of what Unstable Aesthetics is um, stems from just my research and understanding of certain histories of, of uh, the way artists have manipulated media uh, to create psychedelic effects, to create effects that are kind of outside of the, the status quo in that way. Um, this brings up, uh, yeah, it's, my mind is churning. I don't even know where to start as far as um, the questions to ask. But, but how do you lay, let's start out, just how do you lay this book out? Like, how do you divide it up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's kind of it's the book is kind of chronological. Like I, I'm looking at what I would call a recent archaeology of of uh, game engines, video game engines. And by archaeology, I mean uh, kind of tracing an engine in terms of its uh, in terms of its effects, in terms of its um, technical properties mm -hmm. throughout the 1990s and and up really up into the present. Mm -hmm. So the first um, the first chapter looks at uh, an engine as we might understand it through a Nintendo entertainment system, right? And I'm, I'm specifically looking at the work of Corey Archangel, who's a contemporary media artist. So I'll say that each chapter focuses on a contemporary artist and, uh, and a historical engine that they somehow broke, modified, hacked, did something with, right? To kind of reconfigure how we would typically play video games. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first chapter looks at a Nintendo entertainment system as a platform and with an intent with the NES really an engine is this this interesting coordination among um, like the the code that is on that the the program ROM chip within the cartridge and the way that all of these um, technical parts within the console itself are able to kind of coordinate and display um, you know tile patterns and palettes on a screen and so Archangel um, you know he's he's well known for taking NES cartridges, breaking them open and burning new things onto those program ROMs and then playing them. So they're almost like a time-based um, experimental film, right? Uh, and then I, the, the other chapters, if the first chapter is on the NES engine, then I look at um, the Doom engine and I, I'm looking at uh, two artists, Oren Kipkak and Rennie Urban, who created this work, Ars Doom. And uh, it was for the Ars Electronica Festival in 1995. And what they did was they invited uh, many of the artists that were going to be exhibiting at that festival to create digital works. And they recreated the festival venue within a, a Doom game. So they created, they created like a Doom version of the festival. And then they allowed gallery goers to come in and shoot up and destroy the works, right? So it's like this very subversive kind of attack on the on just kind of the politics of, of exhibition and display, right? In, in these kind of art institutions. And then the next chapter looks at Jody, uh, again, an artist duo consisting of Dirk Paisman's and, and uh, Joan Heemskirk. And that's looking at their work Untitled Game, which I mentioned. And that's, again, them just kind of modifying and hacking Quake to create these, these, these certain psychedelic effects. Um, and then the, the, the next chapter is looking at work by Julian Oliver and Tom Betts, who are both contemporary media artists. And both of them were experimenting with the Quake 3 engine. Um, it's a pretty important engine because it was one of the, the first engines to really use bot technology. So um, for those of who have played Quake 3 Arena, uh, yeah, it's a game that's kind of predicated on fighting uh, a, an, an artifact, a computer, uh, fighting an enemy within an arena that's run by artificial intelligence and, and pathfinding. So these bots um, are able to kind of attack and play against um, actual human users um, by kind of, you know, using a series of algorithms to determine how to get to one point from point A to point B the quickest, right? And how to find weapons the quickest. Um, and so both of those artists use that bot technology to create these kind, these kinds of un, these unfolding abstract uh, glitched out um, game worlds, right? Okay. And then the the last chapter focuses on 
more contemporary work by an artist um, collective called Start Select, and that's consisting of Krista Hoffel and uh, Eli Kahn. Um, they made this work, We Build Worlds, in which they uh, glitched out No Man's Sky, which um, if anyone plays No Man's Sky, I mean, it, it was critically panned when it first came out. Um, it's With all of its updates, it's a lot better now, but it's essentially... Uh, it's a really fascinating game about just kind of deep space exploration. It is a procedurally generated game where you can move throughout um, this massive galaxy and kind of explore all of these planets that kind of generate in real time. And so what they did was they glitched out that game world um, to create these kind of abstract scenarios. Uh, so yeah, I would say that's that's more of a rundown of the book. And so it does move chronologically, but it does it really focuses on what I would say are um, key episodes within this history of modding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being able to modify and hack and um, upend uh, conventional forms of gameplay. I'm speaking with Eddie Lohmeyer, author of Unstable Aesthetics. You can find more information about his work at eddielohmeyer.com. If you like this episode of Full Contact Nerd Interviews so far, please tap the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out fullcontactnerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with military historians or get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyinspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Mm -hmm. So, I can. So, uh, do the do these artists always sort of get close to what they're trying to accomplish? Because te technically speaking, you can't always, you know, code what you want to code or or yeah. design what you want to design. How much is deliberate, and how much is just sort of an accidental? Um, consequence of what they're working on? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So a lot of these works, you know, one theme that, that comes up in throughout these chapters is this concept of glitch um, and, and glitch aesthetics. Um, I think we, we think about glitch as, a, as kind of an aesthetic of error, right? Or when something, when a computer program crashes spontaneously and, and when it crashes and gets us out of our kind of typical functionality, usually we're thrown into kind of some unfamiliar abstract interface, right? Like things, you know, if there's, if it's an error in compression, um, if it's an error in decoding or encoding or feedback, we're usually going to get some kind of, um, some kind of noise artifact on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the artists in Unstable Aesthetics are really what they're doing and working with in this longer tradition of of the avant-garde. I mean, even back to somebody like John Cage, who is um, in his musical compositions is giving a lot of agency to an audience, right? Or, or somebody like Cage is, is setting up conditions uh, for a work to kind of come into being and then allow for, um, allow for the environment, individuals within that environment and those certain constraints to kind of allow for that work to unfold. Um, and these artists uh, were using game engines in a similar way. They were using glitch in a way, um, for instance, you know, I, I look at somebody like Julian Oliver's work um, in IOQ3A Paint, and he's uh, again using the Quake 3 Arena engine. But yeah, he's using, a, you know, he's, he's deliberately messing with some lines of code within that source code so that when these bots fight each other, and in an ongoing sense, they're just fighting constantly. It's continually kind of fracturing and blowing up the, the interface into kind of this kaleidoscope of abstract patterns. So yeah, these artists are introducing um, certain parameters, right, uh, for things to glitch out, but they also are letting the engine kind of have agency in itself, right? They're letting the engine kind of unfold and create these works in very kind of surprising and unexpected ways. So to answer that question, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's about 
um, these, these media artists um, creating conditions for, for uh, artistic experience to come into being, but they're also giving some of that up to chance, right? They're giving some of that up to an engine and for participants to kind of let that work unfold. So, so it is a kind of combination of both. They are giving up some authorship um, to just allow an engine to break or destroy itself in a certain way. So how often do you find these, these artists um, designing something just for their own pleasure that they share versus doing it for an audience? I mean, I think I get the sense that with yeah, you know, I get the sense with many of these contemporary artists, like they have a, a very deep interest in the materiality of a video game system. I think that, um, you know, we're, you know, throughout, throughout the certain histories of, of art and avant-garde, like artists have always kind of been attracted to new technologies, right? And they're, you know, technologies that they can kind of break and or reconfigure in a certain way. You think about somebody like Nam June Pike, who in the 60s was, you know, attaching magnets to television sets in order to kind of mess up and glitch out their signals in certain ways. Um, I think that an artist like that had a quite an investment in experimenting with a television, right? Television as a medium in itself. Um, so many of the artists that are, are in this book, yeah, I do think they have a deep interest in, in excavating a, what, a, what a video game engine is or a video game system is. And many of them played games growing up. So I think to answer that question, it's probably a bit of both. I, you know, you look at an artist like Corey Archangel and I mean, his work is very much kind of embedded in his personality. Like he's a very, he's almost like a, an Andy Warhol of the digital age, right? And in, in, in the sense that when you see somebody like Archangel, it's hard to determine whether or not he is kind of putting on this persona right? Um, when he's playing and messing around with these video games. So I do think, yeah, many of these artists do have a deep interest in the ways we play and the way that uh, video games as a relatively new medium are able to kind of um, harness certain sensations and perceptions through interactivity. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, what, uh, do, do the, companies that own these games or the designers, the original designers, do you ever see them commenting on, on what, these mods? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question because modding is, modding is, com modding is a complicated issue. And one, it is because it's always works that are modded are always kind of moving back and forth between what you might call artistic and or more grassroots amateur communities. And then kind of your, your big AAA game industries. And uh, the scholar um, Anne-Marie Schleiner has made an excellent argument about this, that uh, games or modding kind of fits this, this model of the parasite. So in other words, um, when, a, you know, when a company releases a new game, like we'll say something like Grand Theft Auto V, which has a very kind of vibrant modding community, um, that game is released and then oftentimes industries will take note of the ways that their users are modifying games. In the case of something like GTA V, yeah, they responded to that by allowing, or by kind of creating a modding platform, right? And these, and creating certain libraries for their users to modify those games. And so it's always kind of a back and forth. Um, you know, we can think of a video game as, as kind of a host, right? If we're gonna go with this, this biological example. Um, and modders, whether, you know, these are, these might be bedroom coders, these might be just amateur designers and players will often kind of latch on to the underbelly of that host, right, in terms of modding, and they'll begin to create their own kind of experimental works from a, a AAA game engine. And sometimes industries take note of that, and they will kind of recalibrate um, new releases of engines to to accommodate those modders and kind of um, territorialize them into um, other forms of capital and commerce. Uh, but sometimes, um, yeah, I mean, there's been a rich history, especially with Doom and Quake of um, modding communities like, you know, breaking copyright on, uh, 
on, on popular films, for instance, like making a version of, of Aliens or Ghostbusters, right, within a modding game. So modding, it, it always kind of fits this category of, of moving back and forth between popular industries and, and mainstream industries and then kind of these, these experimental subcultures, I could say. Have you seen, you know, when you look at, when you're looking at the 90s to present, I think yeah. one of the big shifts is social media, you know, mm -hmm. arising. Have you seen changes in how modding, this artistic modding is done? Has it changed? Do you see any changes because of social media, the rise of social media? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I think probably in the, the ability to distribute and share um, certain mods or to just call attention to interesting kinds of mods. Yeah, I'm sure social media has made an impact there. Even before social media, I mean, you had these, uh, you know, even in the mid and late 80s, you had what were called uh, cracker communities. Um, and they, these were groups of bedroom coders who were kind of self-taught. And this is mostly in, this is throughout Europe and Scandinavia um, for the most part. But what they would do was they would break copyright on, uh, they would hack certain games for like the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum uh, system and they would break copyright on games and then they would like modify those games so that a player could have unlimited lives or unlimited health and then they would like pirate and distribute them in, in, in these kind of these bulletin board networks, right? We might think of this as like pre-social media. So they could like distribute these, these pirated games, um, you know, throughout Europe and throughout Scandinavia for others to play. Uh, and you see that again, you see that again with the, what's called the demo scene in the early 1990s with Doom. So um, people that were really into Doom, you know, like expert Doom players would do things like speed runs where they could see how quickly they could beat a level and they would use the Doom engine to record the speed runs um, or they would use the Doom engine, you know, they would, they would modify certain things in that engine to record like an awesome death match, right? Um, and then they would submit those to certain online communities um, where you would have judges that would evaluate that speed run, they would make sure it was legit. And then they would give them a title, like the, the highest title you could get was like Doom God, right? Which meant like, you were awesome. Like you, if you could be, you know, like do a speed run um, and there were certain modes, like there would be pacifist mode where you would have to do a speed run on a certain difficulty without using any weapons, right? Um, so yeah, those, you know, those were, those were early kind of social online communities, right? These ability, the ability for these, um, speed runners and these expert players to kind of share their work. So, yeah, I think that there are, there are certainly modding communities now that would take advantage of, of, a kind of, of, of networked communication, right? And those social media outlets, especially, you know, when sharing mods on, a, on games like Skyrim or, uh, you know, GTA five, where you do have these very vibrant communities of, of just weird mods, you know, I would imagine that the more popular games attract more people trying to mod in an artistic sense. Is that, is that accurate or? Well, you know, it's like the popular games, you know, like, I mean, GTA five, they've made it nowadays, they've made it pretty straightforward to be able to like you know, watch a few tutorials and pick up how to modify something or at the very basic, basic sense, like um, run a, another user mod, right? I mean, they have mods, like if you've ever seen, there's a, there's a GTA 5 mod for like a vehicle cannon where instead of shooting bullets or projectiles, like it just shoots different kinds of cars out of like a, a regular size gun, which is a very kind of abstract concept because you're just seeing these cars, you know, hundreds of hundreds of cars like launch across the interface. So yeah, there, I would say there is a there is a kind of interesting mixture of things that are, we would might call just kind of silly and are maybe more abstract. In other words, don't really benefit gameplay, right? But are just kind of in a, in a more of like a sandbox sense, allowing these, these players and designers to just create surreal things within an existing game. But then you do have mods for like shaders and and you have mods that would, for instance, um, you know, Minecraft is a, has a very vibrant modding community. And there's mods for Minecraft that allow for a player to um, experiment with new kinds of ecosystems or to, um, I don't know, improve the, you know, grow the size of your inventory or to apply, 
you know, in the case of GTA five to apply like certain shaders to make the game look better. So I, you know, there's always this interesting balance um, among mods that have a kind of a functionality and might improve those, those aspects of gameplay um, that maybe are more associated with conventional forms of play. And by that, I, you know, that's not a bad thing. I'm, that just means you're playing in the way that a developer might have intended the game to be played. Mm -hmm. But there's always these subcultures that are pushing back against that, that would say, well, yeah, let, why not build a vehicle cannon and just see what happens, right? And, and try to experiment with the possibilities within the constraints of a certain game, so. I guess, so yeah, you kind of use two words that are probably the best to to sort of compare what I'm thinking about, which is you have sure. silly mods versus sub subversive ones. And you you mentioned the Ars yeah. Electronica Festival. Yeah. That, so personally, I, I'm more interested in knowing the different ways people are doing subversive mods because the silly stuff is amusing for, you know, whatever. And then, you know, I don't feel like it has impact but the subversive stuff i think is yeah i don't know if you can talk about that yeah i mean i think what you know some of these mods that we might that might kind of seem silly on the surface might have a kind of political subversion that is not necessarily um explicit right so like think about a vehicle cannon in gta 5 uh is it you know is that a mod that's allowing you to kind of play the game as it is intended i would say no it's 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 introducing a a mode of sensuality and interactivity that kind of pushes back against those forms of normal play. Could we consider that subversive? Maybe in some regards in that it, it kind of disrupts what would be like the, the, the typical flow of gameplay. Um, there, but there's always been examples of subversion within mods. I'm thinking of after Doom was released in 1993, you had a lot of modders that were creating what were called joke wads. And again, a wad, uh, a, the WAD is an acronym for where's all the data. Um, it refers to a, a wad file. So this is a file that specifically with Doom, you could share and upload and, and you can still, I mean, there's a, still a pretty vibrant Doom modding community even for the first Doom mm -hmm. from 1993. But you can share these wad files and then load in other users games, right? Other, other versions of, of, uh, of Doom. But you had what were called joke wads. And so you would have, um, yeah, there was, there was a modder called BPRD that made this joke wad called, wad called Nuts. And what it was, uh, they just designed this giant courtyard and then filled it full of like thousands and thousands of, of enemies, right? And so when the mod starts, you are supposed to just attack all these enemies in the courtyard. But as you continue to attack, there's so much going on within that game that the, the frame rate starts to kind of slow down, right? Because it's like the engine cannot process that visual information fast enough. And so five minutes into playing something like nuts, like the game literally just kind of starts to deteriorate and it, it becomes impossible to play. So yeah, I would call something like that subversive, right? I mean, it's subversive in the sense that it is pushing back against these kind of normal expected avenues of gameplay, right? By, by, by literally breaking the engine or at least unveiling the limitations of a game engine. So, so I know, so, so at least from your bio, I saw that one of your interests and correct me if I'm wrong, is that sort of the, um, how should I put it? Uh, interactions, physical interactions, um, with games, you know, I guess maybe the controllers or, or other aspects of your physical environment. Is that, that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. And I, I'm glad you brought that up. So as, as I've been doing research on this book, um, a lot of the research I've done is, is kind of through hands-on research. So I've been a, I've been an artist for, um, a good while now, uh, quite a few years. Um, and most of my, most of my, my artwork, um, stems from uh, working with kind of experimental sculpture and what we would call uh, alternative controllers. So I, I'm, I'm actually still, I have kind of an ongoing series where I create um, new kinds of um, controller interfaces that are usually just like really useless and or not fun to play on purpose, right? Um, and so 
uh, that was, but a lot of that kind of tinkering with other controllers and hacking and making things myself kind of stood in for um, a, a kind of a form of research in itself to be able to kind of understand, well, here are the ways individuals actually play with these controllers. And these are ways we can negate normal modes of play. But uh, yeah, I, most of my artistic practice uh, focuses on what we might call alternative controllers. And then I do a lot of work with like machinima and um, making experimental film using, using engines, using game engines. So filming inside engines and glitching them out in certain ways. Um, yeah, and you can, you know, for those listening, you can check out my work at eddielohmeyer.com and, and also on my Instagram, which is eddie underscore lohmeyer underscore. Uh, but yeah, I was doing things like, uh, the very first alternative controller I made was, um, it was called Joust Assemblage. And so what I did was I just found a bunch of these kind of junk, various kind of junk parts and, and uh, kind of salvage things. Some of them were like objects that were sharp. Some of them were objects that were just had interesting like textures when you touch them. So I built these two controllers and then I allowed individuals within the gallery to play this game of Joust like the, the old arcade game Joust. Um, and so what they had to do was like touch certain parts of this, this controller, uh, but some parts were just uncomfortable to touch, right? Like it either felt weird to touch or it was something that was, um, wouldn't be like super sharp, but it would just be like, you wouldn't want to like put your hand down on it fast. So it kind of forced them to think about like to slow down and have to like Re rethink how to play by touching these various things on these controllers to play joust. Mm -hmm. I made another one called um, Nail Controller, which was uh, a controller that was used to play, I think it was Excite Bike, um, the, for the, the very first Excite Bike for NES, uh, which is a similar concept. I, I built it out of kind of salvaged wood and, and lots of nails. Um, and so there were like groupings of nails that when put together in a group, you know, they wouldn't be very sharp to touch, but um, each, each of these groupings of nails would kind of substitute for like a certain button. Mm -hmm. So it kind of forced the player to like slowly put their hands on these nails and kind of uh, experiment and feel the tactility of this, this weird sculpture. So yeah, alternative controllers are, are a big part of my research. Um, and in my classes too, I, I, teach, um, I teach at the University of Central Florida um, in Orlando, Florida. Um, and yeah, I do, I teach classes in physical computing where, where my students make just weird controllers, right? They make controllers where, you know, you're, you're reconfiguring just kind of mundane everyday household objects. You know, I've had students make a, a controller out of like an old blender, um, which they, they, they actually took out the blade. So it wasn't like the blade was running all the time, but they use like the buttons on an old blender to make like this weird controller, I think to play like Guitar Hero or something. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, alternative controllers are a big part of my, my research. And they, that, that kind of, those kinds of experiments like messing around with existing controllers or reconfiguring normal expressions of play in many ways, yeah, influence uh, writing on stable aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just point out, I don't know if you've been to MAGFest. I, this is my favorite convention. So. No, I, I haven't <laughs> been. I mean, I haven't been. I've looked at it. I mean, it'd be it'd be awesome to go. I Because I they do have alternative controllers and weird yeah, stuff, right? Yeah. They do. That's, what, that's, that's, that's awesome. what I was thinking of. I'm speaking with Eddie Lohmeyer, author of Unstable Aesthetics. You can find more information about his work at eddielohmeyer.com. If you like this episode of Full Contact Nerd Interview so far, please tap the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out fullcontactnerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with military historians or get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyinspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And, and when you describe, so you're describing the mods and sort of the... Um, maybe the uh, 
psychological effects they they want to inspire and also alternative controllers making people think more about how they move yeah that, that seems like it feels like as as all of this as the mind and electro the electronic world start to combine it's making me think that what you're studying is almost like studying how to reform the mind how to reform how people think yeah yeah that's a that's a really that's a really great point um because i think about you know there is a sense when we sit down and play a game um or we buy a new game and you know for maybe that's for the xbox one or whatever you play you know the playstation 5 right um there's a sense in which yes we're familiar with the the design of that controller um you know we're familiar with the, the a kind of intuitive interface where we know our fingers need to press these certain buttons. But every time we play a new game, that game is going to have new kinds of mechanics, right? It's going to have a new rule set and it's going to take some time to learn, right? So I always think about uh, video game play is, is this, um, this kind of coming together of both the, the physical and effective aspects of my, my body, right? And my, my senses uh, that are always kind of linking up with um, a system, right? And so there, there's always kind of this feedback loop among myself putting, you know, they're uh, putting in certain inputs to control what I can see on screen, and then that system responding in a certain way. So I always think about gameplay as um, this kind of coming together, right? This entwinement among um, the material nature of a system, and then Whatever, whatever kind of effective feedback loops are in my body, but yeah, games, uh, games condition the body. I mean, this is this is very true. Games condition us to play in a certain way, and when we're talking about triple, you know, triple A titles, the big titles, uh, yeah, developers intend for us to play a certain way, um, for a game to be pleasurable, for it to be fun, for it to um, express competition or reward, um, all the reasons we would typically play. So if you introduce an alternative controller or you introduce a, a kind of subversive way to play a game, in many ways, we have to kind of re, retrain, retrain ourselves to play. And so that's something I'm pretty interested in. I'm always, I've always been interested in the way that games build expertise. Mm -hmm. So, and part of that is within the design of a game. I mean, as a game progresses, there's usually you know, there's usually elements that are added into the, that design scheme that make the game progressively more difficult, but at the same time, introduce mechanics that allow us to overcome those obstacles, right? And so, you know, when, when somebody's throwing around the term flow, um, which is used a lot in, 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 the, in the play of video games, among other things, there is always this space between you know, being in, a, being in a state of flow where a game is not too frustrating, but it, it's conversely not, not too boring, right? It has to be in kind of that, that middle area. Um, but yeah, I think about that often. Games do, games through their, their own techniques do often kind of condition us toward expertise, right? Or condition us to, for the mind to kind of, uh, in, our, in our gestures to be mapped onto a controller, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to play. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, one of the big, uh, one topic I really am interested in also is um, using games to educate people in skills, tasks, knowledge. And I guess one worry I have just having this conversation, one worry I have is that if you have educators who are only familiar with sort of the, the AAA style of gaming, you yeah. know, they're, they're going to develop educational systems that may be stunted, whereas the modders you know, either alternative controllers or alternatives to how games are played could help educators, if they tapped into that, could help them figure out better ways to teach. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, in the broadest sense, um, video games don't always have to be, and I try to explain this to my, to my students, you know, because in, in our department, many of our students are, are game designers and developers or, or young game designers and developers that are attempting to improve their, their skills. Games always don't always have to lead to this kind of commercial, you know, first person shooter esque kind of modes of fun and pleasure, right? And in competition. Um, I mean, there's many applications for, for the way video games can hopefully benefit society. And 
you know, there's there's lots of conversation and perhaps in the past decade around serious games, right, or games for change, where you have um, indie game designers who are are developing games that are either for training and simulation, so they have a direct application and say like training, um, you know, training someone in city planning, right, uh, by by a kind of simulation game that might be like similar to something like Sim City, but but has very practical applications built into its design in that in that way. Um, but yeah, I, games can always be used for educational purposes. And I don't think, you know, I think that those, those kind of indie designers can probably borrow some elements from mainstream gaming in the way that there are formulas for, for pleasure and fun, right? Like an educational game on the other end doesn't have to be boring, right? Um, and that has a lot to do with what we might call value-based design or, or value-centric design, where um, a game is designed with, with certain values in mind. And those values might be political or social values. Those values might, you know, deal with something like climate change or, um, you know, a, a, I don't know, prison reform in this country. I mean, it can be any kind of major issue, right? And we're seeing a lot of indie games that are dealing more with um, very real things, like very real, real topics that are important within our everyday lives. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that games... Games always have, or you know, because of it's an interactive medium, they do have that ability to persuade, and that is important too. So on one end, yeah, you have your 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 first person shooters, which are fun. I mean, that's it's not knocking AAA titles. I mean, there's always there's always some kind of uh, of kind of sensual pleasure that comes out of moving through a through a virtual space, right, and exploring that world. But at the same time. Yeah, indie developers can make games that are that are more value centric, that express um, things that might be meaningful to us, or to express, for instance, uh, a certain debate, ongoing debate, so that we can see both sides of that debate, and maybe we learn about a social or political issue through those mechanics of play. Have you uh, have you come across situations where AAA have adopted stuff that uh, that uh mod artists have done no yeah i mean you see that all the time like i mean i'm, I'm trying to think um you know there were some modders in the late 1990s that um out of uh the game half-life developed counter-strike and so counter-strike was originally like a mod made just by you know kind of amateur modders right um and so um yeah valve would take counter-strike and kind of uh, they would kind of situate the rights with Valve, and then they they improved Counter Strike um, with their their newest engine that they came out with. Um, I think it was just the Source. I believe the initial engine was uh, Gold Source, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, with the Source engine, they they kind of revamped Counter Strike and uh, kind of absorbed that that game as a as a kind of grassroots mod back into their. The, you know, their own kind of agenda, right? Uh, another example is like the way a game like Portal, right? Which is a, and I, and I would consider Portal, you know, as a kind of fun, strange puzzle game with interesting physics. Like that was a game that came out, originally came out of Half-Life 2. Um, so yeah, there's ways in which mods are always um, emerging out of these, these more, you know, popular mainstream technologies. But again, back to this idea of kind of the parasite or even more so, not even a parasite, but like a kind of a, a symbiotic relationship really. Um, and Anne-Marie Schleiner argues, argues this too, that uh, the, the relationship between uh, gaming industries and modding communities is, is very much symbiotic at times, right? Because modders will, again, they'll, they'll attach onto the host of a, of a host game engine They'll create a mod using that engine um, that that industry or that company might notice those mods and then create certain platforms for modding or create a new engine with those modifications in mind. And then uh, again, in a content kind of an ongoing cycle, those modders might do something with that new engine and it goes back and forth and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that again, it's always this kind of this gift giving, this reciprocation between um, of, of gaming industries and modding communities. So um, as you research this topic, um, 
and wrote the book. Was there anything that surprised you that you came across? You know, I, I don't know so much surprise. I mean, I guess because I'd worked on this so long, right? Like this was my, my dissertation uh, when, I, when I was getting my PhD. And, and, you know, it's been years of kind of revising this book and working with the material. I think that probably what surprised me the most is the, the, the complexity and technical skill that relates to modding and glitching. I mean, with a lot of these works, if you didn't know the kinds of techniques and practices that were embedded in the creation of these mods, you might just think that these artists were like, you know, breaking open a, a game system and just like, met, you know, cutting wires or like messing or, you know, just trying to destroy things from within without giving much thought into what would be displayed on an interface. But it's actually just the opposite. Like you, an artist like Corey Archangel I mean, he's a, he's a very good, very good programmer. I mean, that's the thing. Like he went, uh, like his, his background is in experimental musical composition, um, but is in many ways is kind of a self-taught programmer, but his modifications for Super Mario Brothers, like he made, um, he made this, this work Super Mario movie in 2005 with a, uh, collaborated with an artist group called Paper Rad. Um, and it is a, it's a film. I mean, it's a short 15 minute film um, that's created, created entirely using um, Super Mario Brothers, right? And just the, the original palettes uh, and uh, tiles within that game. But the game is, is highly orchestrated. Like there's a certain choreography that comes with having to like recode that game and burn it onto um, a new ROM chip, right? I mean, it's not just like, something they did in an afternoon. Like, I mean, creating that kind of experimental film, I mean, it's, it's, it would be very kind of painstaking. I mean, it's not, it requires a, a, a level of expertise to create uh, the tools needed, um, the modding tools needed to, to produce those abstract sequences. And then as you get further into that film, it begins to glitch out more and more where like, you're just getting like these pulses of, of colors and tiles, right? And it becomes very kind of psychedelic um, but none of that is, is necessarily by accident, right? I mean, all of that's very, very much choreographed, right? And it, it abides by a kind of glitch aesthetic. Like when we watch it, even though it is very orchestrated, we think like, man, something's very wrong with this game, right? Or something is, is, is continually breaking with this game. Um, and that's what's so interesting about Archangel's work is that he is harnessing this kind of aesthetic of error, uh, of, of technical failure, and then incorporate it into the, his, his composition, right, as, as it unfolds. So, how, um, so, so we've been, actually, how, how subtle have you seen artistic mods? Like, have you seen mods that are so subtle you can barely even recognize it's been modded, but it's there? Yeah, that's a good question. There are some like that, like Jody, one of their mods in their Untitled Game series is just like a white, I'm pretty, yeah, it's just like a white screen. Mm -hmm. Like they just erased everything from, like the sound effects are still intact for Quake, but you just can't see where you're moving around. Um, so a lot of Jody's work it falls into kind of traditions of, of, of more minimalist art and minimalist sculpture, I would argue, um, yeah, from the 60s and into the 70s. Uh, yeah, a lot of Jody's work deals with those kind of minimalist concerns. Um, you, one of their mods uh, within their Untitled Game series, I well, a few of them, but one of them, Control 9, and there's another one, Control Space, uh, we're just introducing these swirling black and white lines, uh, much like a, a Bridget Riley painting, right? Like an op art painting from the 60s. Um, and as you play it and move around, like it's very, it can be, it can be very nauseating for some people and dizzying, but uh, you can't see anything in the game. Like it makes the game sort of, I mean, pretty much unplayable. Like you can kind of walk around and make out corners and stuff and you can hear enemies coming, but you really can't see what you're doing. And that's all intentional, right? That they're intentionally trying to break uh, the player's ability to like control their, their character and, and play this game in a normal way rewarding way. So yeah, I mean, there are artist mods that are very subtle in that regard that will change a very small thing about the interface in a way that makes it unplayable or a way that makes the game unrecognizable, or in some cases just to make it to where um, 
yet our experience of that game is just uh, kind of taken up in a very subversive abstract mode of play. So, so we've been talking about um, mods to the, like the visuals and the gameplay, but what about sound? How, yeah. how, how often is that modded? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's a good question. I, I'm sure there's some mods out there that deal specifically with sound. Many mods um, incorporate both, you know, disrupting visual elements and, and auditory elements. Uh, if you, or if, if anyone mods, uh, does mods for Doom or Quake, like those original Doom mods, yeah, you were able to, and you can still do this, like you can still use tools to modify the original Doom now. Uh, but yeah, you can take out the original sound effects and like put in new sound effects. Like people do that all the time. Um, you you know you whenever you get a sound effect for an enemy getting um, attacked or killed, or if you hear like a grunt from your player punching or attacking, like you can always switch out those files with other sounds that have nothing to do with the game, right? Mm -hmm. And in that way. Uh, a game like Doom really introduced this idea of a, of a game engine functioning more like a collage, right? Like you could remove certain elements of the game and replace it with seemingly unrelated things. And I think that's a pretty important part of, of modding and the, the strangeness of it, right? As I argue in my book, um, strangeness being this, this kind of liminal space between um, uh, maybe our, our existing knowledge of what a game should be and then the kind of abstract, pulsating, unfolding uh, of, of spaces that are created through these, these glitches and these mods, right? Um, so strangeness relates to a kind of un, a nature of the uncanny, of, of something being surreal, of something being not quite right or viewed from a, a perspective. Um, I like to think about it as, as looking at something from looking at, looking at the inside from the perspective of the outside, right? So... Um, it's like if, if we typically know how a game engine runs, right, and all of its bare bone mechanisms, and these modding experiments allow us to kind of see the, the layers underneath an interface, right, by, by either destroying those games or, or breaking those games or hacking those games, we're seeing how the game engine runs. And that is very unfamiliar and strange, right? There's a, there's a certain strangeness to revealing how a media technology should work right? Um, by kind of inverting its, its functionality and, and our ability to understand it. So where do a lot of these um, mod artists, um, where are they from? I can imagine the US and Europe has a lot, but where else have you seen these artists from? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the artists I focus on in, in my book are, um, let me think, yeah, I think Julian Oliver is an Australian artist, I believe. Um, yeah, some of these artists are, uh, I mean, Jody are, uh, they're, they're both Dutch. Um, Corey Archangel, I think is from the US. I mean, they're all over the, they're all over the place, they're all over the world. I mean, there, there are, are modding communities in, um, in, in many Asian countries that are very vibrant and strong. Uh, yeah, like modding is a very kind of global, global phenomenon. Uh, I think that anytime, anytime you have um, gaming communities and gaming subcultures, some of those cultures, those subcultures are going to be modifying games. I think that just comes with the territory of having engines that are, you know, having a software framework that a player can kind of explore, right? Mm -hmm. And having engines that are extensible, as we might say, or, or modifiable is something that um, really begins to take off in the early 1990s with, with id software and games like Doom and Quake. Mm -hmm. um, so once you have that tradition, that kind of trajectory, yeah, you have anytime you have these these newer engines or an engine that's released that um, that controls the way a game's rendered and its physics and our, our ability to move throughout that game, I would wager that you're always going to have communities that are interested in opening up that engine and and uh, using it to create uh, new works and new new forms of user generated content. So. Are there any countries where, because of the laws, um, for whatever reason, it's harder for people to mod or be sort of artistic, experimental artists in this way? Or yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I'm not. I'm not real sure. I mean, I guess it would depend on like copyright laws. I mean, like I think that there's there there might be some issues there. Um, I know that with early cracker communities, as I mentioned, like these these bedroom coders who were 
pirating and sharing um, like Commodore 64 games. Like they were, a lot of them were like sending these games um, across the Iron Curtain um, to countries like where, you know, like Soviet countries where those games would be really hard to get or you weren't allowed to play those games. So yeah, there are, but I don't know in the, you know, globally in this day and age, I don't know. That's a really good question. I'm not too sure if there's certain countries that would outlaw modding or if modding would be considered like some kind of some kind of legality there with copyright, right? And being able to like harness these engines and use them for your own own artistic purposes. But yeah, that's a good question. And I want yeah, I'm wondering if any of the mods become political in any way, you know, if, if that could get people in trouble. That's why I'm curious. Certain countries would yeah, I mean, like, well, there's always, there's also this rich history of kind of politics in modding too. Um, actually, in the conclusion of my book, I talk about uh, Anne-Marie Schleiner, who I mentioned in 2002, uh, made this work Velvet Strike, that's a very, uh, very well-known mod. Um, and she made that along with uh, Joan Leandra and Brody Condon, who are two other uh, media artists. Uh, Velvet Strike was a modification for Counter-Strike. Um, and so Counter-Strike... Counter-Strike came along in this, this weird space that was kind of post 9-11. And during this time, you did have a lot of, um, you did have a lot of prejudice, prejudices toward um, the Middle East and uh, individuals that, you know, practice Islam and whatnot. Um, and so they noticed that. They noticed that in the way the games were designed and they just noticed that in the way that players were increasingly prejudiced towards um, towards anyone who might come from a Middle Eastern country, right? Especially during this time where everyone's extremely kind of paranoid, right? And national security is a concern. And so they made this kind of anti-war uh, protest game where um, Velvet Strike, instead of actually shooting weapons, a player um, can, can shoot, or I guess, I guess the term would be tag, but they can like tag these, these spray paint patterns onto the walls that are like these anti-war protest patterns, right? So, um, and the, what they did, the artists, what they did, and I think this was for, they did this at the Whitney one year, uh, maybe for, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was at the Whitney. Um, they did like this kind of performative play session where they they logged on to an, um, one of the servers in, in Counter-Strike. And so they just began tagging things instead of like actually you know, engaging in deathmatch or doing anything. So they were just putting up these anti, um, these anti-war protest symbols all over the place. And like all these gamers got like very upset, right? Like they got all of this hate mail saying that like, it's just a game. Why would you disrupt our, the way we play this game? And so, yeah, I think that Schleiner is definitely a pioneer in that and in, in those kinds of subversive politics, right? And like using a mod to really, express a certain political message right through those mechanics of play um and as a group yeah like those artists were using velvet strike to right to use um, a game modification as like a a, a, a way to a, it's a political protest which i think is, is really fascinating in that regard yeah. that um modding can be used in that way and that through those kind of subversive politics yeah so um what are you uh working on now any project current projects yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, most of my, uh, as the book's finished up, I'm, I'm right now, I'm just, I'm working on finishing up several um, art projects. Most of them are in the realm of experimental film and or machinima. Um, I'm actually working on a, uh, on a commission. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I can discuss, I mean, I can discuss, I just won't say where it is or, um, because it, it's, it's part of a, it's part of a, uh, upcoming opening so in the yeah the opening hasn't happened yet so um but yeah no it's a project that what i've been doing is like glitching out old nes and n64 games and then layering them through mask layers in certain ways so that they create kind of these giant maps and landscapes and then um i've been editing them so that they they look like they are um images taken from a satellite and so that is that is one element of kind of experimental machinima I've been working with. Uh, a lot of what I do is I will take video games and you know glitch them out in certain ways, and then use oftentimes very repetitive, fairly straightforward editing techniques to create complexity 
Um, and I, like, I like to create a lot of complexity in my work. A lot of that has to do with concepts of um, harnessing certain video games and technologies for meditative purposes. I, I, I like to try to, um, uh, I do have, there's a lot of connections in my work and using video games and our experience of games as it relates to things like Zen Buddhism and whatnot and in creating these kind of meditative, oftentimes psychedelic states. Um, I had another work, it was a, a, another machinima um, in which I glitched out uh, sequences from Red Dead Redemption 2, um, landscapes in Red Dead Redemption 2, um, to create this kind of, this, this space that we might consider like limbo. It was a space, um, a generative space that's at, at one time kind of apprehensive, but beautiful. Um, and that film actually just recently played at the Milan Machinima Festival, which is a, a pretty big festival um, that invites artists, um, usually a fairly small group of artists uh, each year to show work like experimental films that have been made using game engines. So um, I just showed some work there, but yeah, the rest of my, you know, from here on out, lots of my work is just gonna be focusing on finishing up some experimental films um, for various venues. And just like I said, glitching out and or dismantling video games and then thinking about um, our movement and experience of those games through um, experiments in, in time-based film and projections and, and large-scale projections. So that's that's kind of the, the gist of my work as of right now. Okay. And uh, you, you had mentioned your online um, presence. Can you say again what uh, website, social media you have? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so most of my most of my work you can see on Instagram. That's kind of the main platform I use, and that should be Eddie underscore Lomire underscore mm -hmm. um, on Instagram. And then um, my personal website is EddieLomire dot com. Um, it's been a little bit of time since I've put some updates on there, but you can definitely check out uh, my alternative controllers on there and, and things I've made. So there's so if you're, you have, if you have interest in alternative controllers, um, you know, for those listening, uh, yeah check it out because it, you know, it might kind of give you a bit of an idea of what alternative controllers are and how they can kind of uh, reconfigure our, our traditional experiences of play. So that's, that's eddielohmeyer.com. And I'll spell that for people. It's Eddie is E-D-D-I-E -E, and Lohmeyer yes. is L-O-H-M-E-Y-E-R. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any parting thoughts or words? Um, I don't, you know, I, if you, you know, if you do have an interest, I will say in, in, in the broadest sense, histories of recent forms of digital media. And if you have an interest in the, the technical advances and especially our experience of, of certain media effects, I would encourage you to check out Unstable Aesthetics. It's a book that um, I've written with, with a few things in mind. Um, the book hopefully, I mean, that's essentially how I wrote the book. It, it does a, job, a good job of triangulating um, these modding techniques in a very specific way. So I, I do kind of go through and look at exactly what these artists were doing when they were breaking open these engines and, and changing around code and messing around with these engines to create experimental mods. Um, I also look at the historical conditions that allowed for engines to kind of come into being in the early 90s. So it is in, in one part, a recent history of game engines. Mm -hmm. um, it, is a, it does a kind of deep dive to look at the, the mechanisms of modding these engines. But the other important aspect is it really focuses on bodily experience, um, which is something I don't think um, scholars focus, uh, focus on enough in game studies in general, um, is that our, you know, we have, there's certain ingrained experiences of play we might have, right? Based on how we play something Typically, our buttons, you know, our, our fingers press certain buttons. We're able to see um, audiovisual forms on a screen that coordinate to um, our tactility. Uh, but this book really kind of breaks that apart in many ways. It shows that um, these mods very much change the way we play, and they change them. In, uh, they change our, our our sensations and perceptions of play in very interesting and compelling ways, right? Um, through these psychedelic pulsating abstract forms. And so it, it very much is a book about the experience of abstraction in that sense. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, check it out if, if, if uh, histories of 
you know, recent histories of digital media, something that you would be interested in. Yeah. 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 I agree. This is fascinating stuff. Um, all right. Well, thanks very much for speaking with me. Of course. Thanks so much, Chris. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, ask these really great questions. Yeah. And it was, a, this was an awesome conversation. I'm really happy to just get, you know, get out there and, and have someone talk about modding. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. In the next episode, I speak with Josh Mallerman, author of Bird Box and Goblin. Hit the subscribe button to catch that episode. Thank you for watching this video version of Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you like the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more book suggestions or information on fiction and storytelling, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. Thank you for watching, and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm.